you have a dice lens, I have a dice lens, we're all not shooting the same thing. Sure, I can use AI, you can use AI, but we all have different ways in which we can use that technology to essentially empower our vision or what we're trying to achieve. Welcome to VP Land, the podcast where we explore the tools, projects, and people that are changing the way we are making movies. I am Joey Dowd, your host. In this episode, we talk with Nick Hayes and Tanner Grimshaw from Zeiss about the new Zeiss SynCraft scenario for camera tracking. Most people want to come in. I just want to turn the system on and it works. The SynCraft scenario, which used to be NCAM before Zeiss bought it back in 2023, offers multiple methods for camera tracking. As most customers working in virtual production know, Calibrating a lens is a very time-consuming, cumbersome process. It can take an entire day in some cases. So we talk about optics, when and why you need to use different methods for tracking, and how the system learns about the environment it is tracking. Our system, because it's so sensitive and in tune to the environment, it's constantly learning its world's environment. I mean, it can pick up blades of grass, contrast points between blades, and understand and remember points on a field. We'll also discuss the new Zeiss Nano Prime lenses, their thoughts on AI and the film industry, and a whole lot more. I feel that the film industry specifically is all about human storytelling. To create content that should always be concrete that should never change links for everything we talk about are available in the youtube description or in the show notes and be sure to subscribe to the vp land newsletter to stay ahead of the latest tech changing the way we're making movies just go to vp-land.com and now let's dive into virtual production with nick and tanner from zeiss all right nick and tanner thanks for joining appreciate it um, so yeah, before we'll kind of jump into SynCrafts and get a, a review of uh, what's going on with Zeiss, but uh, first off, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your background. So Tanner, if you want to go first, just a little bit about uh, how you came to Zeiss. So a long, long time ago, a place called Red Digital Cinema. Uh, I worked there for seven and a half years as uh, just one of the support techs there. And actually, Nick and I worked both at Red, and it's funny how we kind of came to now work for Zeiss, but previously that was NCAM before it was acquired. But I've always been uh, involved in cameras. Uh, I studied film in school. And so I started at Red Digital Cinema, initially jumped in as doing tech support for essentially anything related to the cameras. And from there, uh, I established a good relationship with one of the guys there that was on my team. And he moved on to NCAM. And that's what then kind of then spearheaded me down the line to get into tracking for NCAM and getting more into the virtual production space of things. It definitely was a different shift from going to cameras, which is just centered just about the camera, versus camera tracking is all these different components that come into the different field of it. So it was definitely a shift in it, but definitely something that was intriguing and different and interesting, of course, from that standpoint. Then from there, Zeiss came into the picture. Zeiss has actually been in talks with NCAM for a while in terms of uh, integrating between their extended data and tracking mm -hmm. and how that integrates in. And then it eventually became clear that they wanted to get more involved. And that's where we then became acquired by Zeiss uh, last year. Right. So 2023, and then now you are part yep. of Zeiss. Yep. Rebranded as the Zeiss SynCraft scenario. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yes, yep. Yeah. But it's just a little bit, it's, yeah. So think of it as an umbrella. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll jump into that in a sec. But uh, yeah, Nick, what's, uh, I know you have a, I believe a similar path, but what's your, your journey? Yeah. No, uh, thanks Joey for having us. Um, yeah, I went to film school at Long Beach state and like many, he didn't want to be a director or camera operator, worked in the creative field and quickly discovered, um, that this was, you know, being on set long hours, uh, this wasn't quite for me, but I knew I wanted to still work in the industry in some capacity. Uh, so I was hired by red as a, a sales rep, uh, worked there for close to six years, uh, kind of cutting my chops in sales and marketing. I uh, met a lot of really great people, a lot of great customers, and um, shifted from Red to a company called Ingenue, uh, big lens manufacturer, French lens manufacturer, well well known in the industry. I uh, was there for two years before moving to Teradec, uh, or really Vitec Group at the time. They own Teradec and uh, a few other brands, including Wooden Camera and Small HD. Uh, so I managed those three brands for um, for Creative Solutions division of Vitec. Um, after that, I went over to NCAM, uh, which is where I reconnected with Tanner, of course, uh, and I've been their sales director uh, for close to two years now. Um, uh, we were acquired, of course, by Zeiss this past summer. 
uh, and have been kind of folded into the, the Zeiss umbrella, uh, so to speak. And we're you know very happy. It's a great group to work for, and we've we've obviously made some uh, big progress with Scenario. But yeah, as kind of Tanner mentioned, you know we we both have a lot of experience in different areas of this awesome industry, working uh, you know in cameras and uh, for me with lenses and um, peripheral. Uh, but visual effects is is definitely um, an interesting one. Um, you know, there's as it really as it relates to virtual production, there's um, been a lot of growth in this area. The the sky's the limit uh, when it comes to virtual production. There's there's a lot um, uh, a lot of new technology and and workflows coming about. So we're really excited to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, speaking of workflows, so the interesting thing about this Syncraft is it really does accommodate a lot of different workflows. So you want to kind of give me the high level overview and of all the tracking options, and we kind of jump into some more details of how you've been seeing that used. But uh, yeah, what's the high level overview of SynCraft and how it can track? Sure, so Zeiss SynCraft Scenario is a real-time camera and lens tracking system. The uniqueness of our system, really its, it's key differentiator is that it has the ability to track off of natural features within the environment. It does not require markers in order to be used, in order to track. That makes it extremely flexible. You can set up the system indoors, outdoors, on a football field, in a studio environment really anywhere where there's static contrast, points that the, the system can reference and understand where it is in three-dimensional space. So NCAM, our bread and butter really is in-camera visual effects, the ability to understand what a camera is doing in real time. Is it panning? Is it trucking? Is it tilting? What is the camera doing? Where is it in space in real time? And then being able to send that data into a graphics processor or a renderer to produce a environment, a scene, a graphic, all in real time. So in-camera visual effects. That's really where we got our start and what we continue to, um, to focus on heavily. Uh, so that workflow, that use case is very much a big part of our system and kind of what we solve. But on top of that, you know, we do also have the ability to record all of that data, not just camera information, but also lens information in a very convenient, easy to manage way. We store all that data into a small herd file that's logged onto our server that can be then offloaded, exported to any format that you want. So we're really solving for two different use cases, both in-camera visual effects, live data streaming to a server, um, and then the recording aspect, being able to, to log that data, save it, and use it to later in post. And so those two use cases that we, I guess, prefer more commonly associated, the in-camera visual effects, that's where we're thinking of virtual production on an LED wall. We need to track the camera data in real time and update a 3D environment in real time for production. And then the second part, that use case would be more for you want that camera data for visual effects later on. Is that the main use case or are there other use cases? that I'm skipping in that, that's like where this uh, data would come into play? Yeah, that would be the main use case, you know, being able to record camera and lens information and then allow your post VFX supervisor to not have to go through the grueling match move process, mm. uh, understand a lens um, characteristics you know, after the fact, understand what a camera is doing after the fact. They have all access to all that data up front, um, which can be a huge time saver and of course cost saver as well. And what are some of the other, I know you can track off natural objects, but uh, there are some other ways that you can track as well. What are some of the other Yeah, no, thanks for, yeah, um, thanks for that. Yeah, so our, our main kind of differentiator, again, is that we don't require markers, but that doesn't mean that we can't use markers. Uh, so we, we really have three different methods for tracking. We have our natural feature mode, which again is that very flexible markerless mode. We also can track off of the kind of the traditional way of using reflective markers, our little small circular discs that can be placed on the ceiling or the floor, or really anywhere in your environment. And our sensor sees those markers, understands where they are in space, and it can also use infrared to reflect off of those markers and create a point cloud. Now with markers, the challenge is that if you're outdoors, you know, kind of where do you put them? Um, it's not always convenient to be able to place markers, but if you are in a studio environment uh, and you want repeatability, you want to be able to show up here on the system and have a very stable tracking environment, then reflective markers is a great way to go. We highly recommend studio environments, you know, use reflective markers if, if they can. Uh, but if you have very high ceilings, if you're moving the camera around a lot, if you're, you know, again, wanting to break down the system and take it outdoors or pack it up and take it across country, um, you know, you're constantly on the go. The natural feature, natural features may be a uh, best method. Um, we also have a, a third method, um, 
that uh, utilizes digital markers that can be seen on an LED volume. Uh, this is commonly referred to as frame remapping or even ghost frame, where we can sync our camera's sensor with an LED volume. And the sensor and the LED volume is get twice the frame rate of whatever the main camera is recording at. So if you're shooting at 24 frames per second, your volume is synced to 48, our sensor is synced to 48. And the B frame of every, of, of the frame of the LED uh, shows some form of a QR code or marker, digital marker, that our sensor is seen, but the human eye and the main camera is not seen. So that is the, our third way of tracking, is this frame remapping um, technology that's rather new. But if you are in an LED volume that's you're completely surrounded, you know, full volume, head to floor, uh, LED, probably pretty hard to put up reflective markers. Uh, there's not a whole lot of natural features to track on, so what do you do? You have that ability to track off of uh, digital markers as well. Can you run the digital markers uh, even if your camera, we did a demo with Ghost Frame at NAB last year. And so a lot of the use case was shooting with a specific camera and getting two or three different outputs. One of the outputs possibly being like your virtual environment, the other output, maybe a green screen or a green screen with tracker markers if you needed to replace stuff later. And so those cameras were recording, they were set up to record the two or three different feeds with the tracker list markers on SynCraft. If you just had a camera that wasn't configured to record two separate feeds, but the SynCraft is recording the markers. Basically, I'm saying, could you use the SynCraft on the volume, running the frame mapping, tracking on the LED wall without having to have your camera set up to record the two separate feeds? Like without having to sync to the wall? Not sync to the wall. Is it separate from what the camera, like the camera would just still be recording one feed. The SynCraft is doing its own thing in tracking and looking at the separate frames that, that are invisible to the camera. The digital markers that we're seeing from the camera bar, that's really what's needing to be synced. The camera doesn't need to see those that separate feed because what we're using so is... this is the, just a SimCraft feed. Yep. Correct, because we're orienting essentially that virtual world or that AR object or however, whatever they're using the tracking for, usually it's in a virtual set. To orient that, we need those digital markers, but the main camera feed is just recording the LED volume on that A frame, as Nick said. And that doesn't need to be mm -hmm. seeing a separate feed of the B for any reason on that front. So ours is just maintaining that tracking. And so that way they're doing the live in-camera effects. They can see that. Also recording that tracking data, we're recording all the information that it's tracking off of. So we have that point cloud data, the lens data, but in terms of that main camera feed, we're not needing to see that specifically. Right. Okay. Got it. Yeah, thanks for the uh, clarification. Yeah, no, and there's a lot with these things. And, it's a, and again, we're all learning here. So if there's something that doesn't need clarifying, I mean, I learned something from Nick and Nick learned something from me and I'm sure I'll learn something from you. So by all means. Yeah, just trying to put everything out there. Um, yeah. I mean, have you found, I mean, I guess it really depends on what type of scene you're looking at, but like that one method tracks better than the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Nick. Great point. Yeah, go for it, Nick. <laughs> you, do you want me to no, take this no, one, or do you want to? I was just going to say. <clears throat> so, natural features, being natural features, they are contingent on the lighting and the environment, and the exposure. So, it's looking for edges, like even the back of this frame, it would pick up parts on the contrast here and edges and frames. So, it's looking for those sharp edges. If all of a sudden, hey, all the house lights go turned off having a better representation of where that is, or maybe the camera goes to a different angle. Now that sharp edge it had from one angle doesn't look so sharp on this. So it's learning all these points, but it's very contingent on that environment. So of course, when you're outside, the lighting's not changing drastically unless you have a really cloudy day and it's going, but even then it's not that extreme. We're talking about dynamic lighting changes inside. So <clears throat> for tracking purposes, we generally say, if you're outside, of course, natural features, people aren't sticking up markers down on dirt. Also or hard to put stickers on the floor. Outside. Exactly, yeah. and not going up in the air. So at that point, natural features is the clear winner for outside. You can use it indoors, but because things are changing, maybe they're moving lights around, you're constantly having to look at the system and adjust things on the go. So you can use natural features, but generally we would say, okay, putting markers are going to be the best in terms of repeatability cases where you're wanting to go in, hey, you know, we've got our stage, we have our zero point set, which is where we orient our world or our graphics every single time. We want just that repeatable case. If things that makes it so those markers aren't moving, that way you can go in and it finds those markers and it helps maintain the tracking to where it's repeatable versus if things change all the time and the exposure changing or they have a lot of dynamic lighting changes, those natural feature points aren't as going to be as robust as saying a physical marker where 
we to the three points that Nick talked about is we natural features markers and then just the digital markers or the frame remapping we can also to help make it even a bit stronger is put an IR filter on the camera bar and that isolates visible spectrum and just concentrates only on tracking IR so we can actually illuminate those reflective markers with IR light to pick them up so that way, if there is a lot of dynamic lighting changes, it's not being seen from the camera bar's perspective. It's only concentrating on the IR spectrum. So that way, we can help get stronger tracking. And if you once you calibrate, if you're going with the the marker route, um, yeah. Once you if you if you set up an area like a studio that you're using all the time, if you once you mm -hmm. calibrate it once, are you able to save yep. that calibration and just pop back in there? Yep. And not have to like recalibrate every time. Yep. That's and I guess exactly same question. I don't know if that also would apply to the object marker or if you, if that. Yeah, if you did natural to features, to natural the features. point, to, to, to kind of answer your questions both end, if you were to go into a studio space and the lighting was exactly the same in which you did natural features, it'll reorient and find itself because that hasn't changed. But it depends on how much has changed to that degree where it might have a hard time finding itself depending on extreme lighting changes. You can adjust it and get it back to a place where it recovers but it's just how much hand-holding do you want to do in that moment, which is where we usually say most people, and Nick can <laughs> correct me if I want, but most people want to come in, I just want to turn the system on and it works. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do a whole lot of tinkering, I don't want to do a lot. And you really don't have to do that when you're outside. You know, you turn it on, it instantly grabs points, you select one of those points, and you're practically tracking at that point. There's not a whole lot. Uh, with going into a studio, if things are changing in LED volume and you've got a lot of lighting changes, those are all impacts on those natural features. So that's where we usually generally say markers is the way to go if you're indoors. Not that you can't, but you, then you're going to have to then, okay, I might have to do a little bit more hand-holding with the system and designate somebody to kind of monitor that. Versus if I all of a sudden have markers, put a IR filter on it, as long as once you get it dialed in, you can go in, power everything on, and it says, great, I see those markers anywhere in the space because you've essentially set it up properly then you're off the grounds running because it's all concentrating on those markers that aren't changing. Yeah, and just to add, I think our system provides flexibility. So mm -hmm. whatever environment that you're in, you will be able to find a method of tracking to use. So it's just more about understanding that environment, um, understanding kind of the limitations, and then choosing the most conducive tracking method uh, for you. But because we offer those three different, very flexible methods, it gives our customers a lot more creative control and creative freedom to use our product. And uh, on the same route of calibration, and I also imagine this is one of the main reasons why Zeiss was interested in NCAM, uh, but you have the connection with the lens and XD data. So can you um, give me an overview of how uh, Syncraft communicates with the lenses and contrast that also with what you'd have to do in the past to calibrate the lenses sure. with a tracker, what that process was like and how it's kind of different now that everything is integrated. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. So um, as most customers working in virtual production know, um, calibrating a lens is a very time consuming, cumbersome process. It can take an entire day in some cases. And also there is a lot of room for error. If you calibrate a lens the wrong way, you know, you, you may not get sufficient tracking or sufficient data. When Zeiss acquired NCAM, you know, they, of course, being a lens company, they understand a lot about lenses and a lot about how to improve this process. Aside from natural features, one of the key features to our product is when using Zeiss lenses with our system in its current state, we do not require lens calibration. You simply choose which Zeiss lens or Aries Zeiss lens that you're using within our software, as well as which camera or which sensor you're using. And the system will automatically calibrate for that particular equipment setup that you create. And there's no extra you know, steps that you need to take in regards to lens calibration. As I mentioned, we only support Zeiss lenses and Aries Zeiss lenses right now. We're kind of in this phase one, as we call it, of our, our product release. By April, we're, we're saying uh, you know, April NAB time, uh, we should um, be able to offer, or we, we will be able to offer uh, third-party lens support for over 100 uh, third-party lenses you know, from the likes of you know, Ingenue, Canon, Cook, Leica, Fujinon. And uh, that, of course, will open up our system to support 
a variety of other lens systems. Fast calibration within our system will be built in. So there's, there's no add calibration required. The only thing that we will add is um, almost like a, a fine tune tool. Uh, so a customer can go in and maybe make some minor adjustments to a specific lens template or to lens file to tune that file for a specific, the specific lens that they're using. Uh, as we know, no lens is exactly the same. So you may want to make some minor adjustments. Uh, so that, that phase two of the process will come in by April. Uh, and then phase three um, will support manual lens calibration. So returning to kind of the normal way of uh, calibrating a lens, and uh, we will have a full tool built into our UI, which will be very um, you know, easy to work through um, and allow you to really calibrate any lens under the sun. So those are the kind of three phases to, as it relates to, to lens calibration. And now um, we also, you know, we need to understand what a lens is doing in real time, right? We need to know, uh, is it focusing? Is it zooming? Um, we, we need to have that, that, data coming through. The nice way with Zeiss, the easy way of doing that is to take that lens data right out of the XD port and channel that into our system. So we can take lens data from the XD port, send it into our server, and it'll automatically recognize what the lens is doing. We also can take lens information out of the pinout from a smart mount lens and send that into a camera's LDS protocol. So Airy, Sony both support lens integration into their camera, um, and we can read that information over SDI. Another way to understand what a lens is doing is to take that information from an LCS, a lens control system. So whether you're using a Preston, Airy, a Teradek lens control system, a Fizz system, we can take the lens information from the motors. You would need to know kind of what the lens parameters are. That would be another way. All right, so you could do that currently, or is that a phase two or phase three? That's going to be more of a next phase. Right now, because we're only supporting Zeiss lenses, the best way to take lens data is over the XD port or over the, the pinout from the lens. Um, the next kind of second phase will open up support for, you know, these other lens encoding systems. Just because there'll need to be the fine tuning aspect of it. And right now in the software, because it only supports Ari and Zeiss lenses, because we have those calibrations based off those lenses, the other external options that we usually have those different encoding options, as Nick said, Preston, C-Motion, Delta, Canon, Fujinon. We have those different encoder options, and they're just a cable that essentially either plugs directly into the lens or directly into the motor through that. So that will come in phase two when we open to the third party. It's already there. It's just now being built in, and they'll only have one component. They'll get the lens data information, but in terms of fine-tuning that lens or a template off it, they won't mm -hmm. have that. So that's where that integration needs to come into phase two. So the cables, those are done, but it's just the other part of it, integrating that. Is this process like you take the lenses from these other manufacturers and calibrate them yourself to like build out this calibration? Correct. Yeah, essentially it's taking the information, mapping the parameters and building a template off it. And then from there, because of course, no two lenses are the same, they'll have to do some fine tuning off of it on there. And if there is any, if need be. Speed of phases and stuff, and I don't uh, know if you can talk to this, but one of the camera bar tutorial videos I was watching, so it was explaining mm. how the two widest lenses were used for tracking and seeing, but that there were two cameras in the middle of the camera bar, and it just said, it's there, we're not using it, but it might be used in the future. Any uh, scenarios or what future use cases that might be in additional tracking or how that might be used? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't talk too much about that. Like, we, we you know, we, we have a long roadmap, um, mm. and we have... Um, some very interesting kind of technology and ideas for how to um, deploy that technology. Right now, you know, we, we are focused on building the most flexible, easy to use, and kind of widely accepted tracking system in the industry. We want this to hopefully be on every set uh, you know, out there, including, you know, big broadcast and live event applications. So we want to make, and, and we understand that in order to do that, we need to make a system that's very easy to use, very convenient, but also provide as much data as possible to, you know, graphics engine, if it's, you know, for ICVFX or for our post house for, you know, being, if you're recording that data. Now, we, of course, are looking at other ways that we can, you know, offer clients uh, more and, you know, safe to say that that Zeiss is heavily invested. You know, in um, in coming up with you know new technology and new ways to provide. 
data for lenses, for camera tracking information, and just making that as convenient as possible. But uh, as it relates specifically to the sensor, some of the tech that's already in there, I, I'm not able to kind of divulge on, on what we have in mind, but uh, it, it is kind of part of our roadmap. So I guess more to come on that. Joey, real quick, are you just talking about like there's the two lenses on the camera bar and then there's two other lenses on the inside? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, not the IR sensors on the outskirts. There, oh. it's a, it mentioned two additional lenses and just was like, we don't use these in the tutorial. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's the external port. Yeah, okay. I thought you were talking about there's the left imager and the right imager, and then there's an RGB sensor, and then there's an IR sensor on the camera bar. So I didn't know if that's what you were talking about on the front part. Okay, no, I think it was, yeah, two additional cameras towards the center of the bar. The sensor is built on Intel's RealSense technology. So it's a RealSense bar inside. So it, it has a lot of different tools and sensors kind of built into the bar. Anybody can look up and kind of understand kind of what's in there. Our solution is really the software and the tracking protocol that we've created and kind of how we use that protocol, how we send it through a data stream, and then also kind of what other pieces are we taking. We're taking lens information, we're taking other camera information. You can look up what the tech is, but it's just kind of how what, what we do with that tech. It's, it's going to be interesting. I think that's the part that we're kind of talking is like there's the left and right imager, which we use, and then there's an RGB sensor, which we really don't use, and then there's the IR sensor which we do use. Oh, okay. So the two, the two left and right is what we use for tracking. There's an RGB sensor lens, and then there's a one that's reading the IR light. And so we use that. We don't use the RGB one. That's essentially disabled. Now, whether we use that as a further way down the line for depth or other calculations, that's to be told that at a future point, I have no idea. But we're not utilizing that. We're only using the left and right eye as a, like how we refer to it, as well as the IR but there's that RGB one right in the center. So I think that's what you're talking about. Okay, I think that must be it then. Um, okay. And then, yeah, but speaking of the software, because do you want to touch on, because there is a separate software, and that's is that software scenario? The, yes. Yeah. The, okay. Do, yeah. yeah, do you want to explain also how that kind of ties into um, the actual hardware and, and, and what you can right. do with the software? Yeah, so our solution is comprised of kind of two different, pieces, so to speak. You have the hardware piece and the software piece. The hardware is pretty straightforward. You have a sensor, which is called our cam bar. You have our server, which is called the origin. And then we have an optional piece called the link. We call it kind of a bridge between the sensor and our origin server. That data stream is then sent, of course, into our origin, which is running the software. Our software is browser-based, so you can just simply open up the software on any browser window. Um, and I would say arguably the biggest improvement coming from NCAM to Zeiss, you know, and really what Zeiss has focused a lot of their attention on is our software. The overall user experience and design of our software is built from the ground up. I mean, it's completely overhauled. And what I'm really proud of is our team really listened to our customer base and put a lot of effort into creating a very intuitive workflow, clean system. You know, it's very easy to kind of walk through the steps of setting up tracking, even for the first time. We believe that this system requires very little to even no training, um, you know, for, for an average user uh, to, to, to set up and to track. Um, part of the reason is, is because of the technology I've described. I mean, it, it can track off of natural features. Therefore, you don't have to set up markers. So there's very little calibration when it comes to that kind of starting to track. Secondly, the, the lens calibration that I talked about where or at least right now, where if you're losing a Zeiss lens or eventually if you're using a third party, you know, supported lens, you, you wouldn't need to calibrate a lens. So that part is done for you. Um, so there's really, you know, a, a limited amount of things that you need to kind of know or do to get the system running. And um, those kind of pieces within our software, um, kind of those steps are very kind of easy to understand. And um, you know, this is just the beginning. The system launched just at the end of last year and our software is already um, you know, extremely intuitive and easy to, easy to kind of run. So I imagine that we will only get smoother as we go. The main point here with the software is quick setup. The main, the main kind of points to setting up the system for the first time is one, doing a camera bar offset, which you're doing here is telling the software where the cam bar, the sensor mm -hmm. is in relation to the nodal point of the main camera. So where is that camera bar placed? 
And again, we're very proud of, a, of the tool that we've built to do that offset. It's extremely fast. It generally gets the most wows, um, you know, and most big eyes from our, uh, our customers and, and just how easy and how fast it is. We use a fiducial chart, you know, it's a chart about eight by 10 um, that will be placed on a C stand or a chair in anywhere kind of in your room. You will tilt the sensor down so the sensor sees the fiducial. Um, you'll then tilt the camera, main camera, to see the fiducial so the, the two will kind of see this unique object and align based off of where they are in relation to each other. Uh, and the system will then automatically calculate that, that difference um, and place the sensor on top of our camera. Uh, so again, that, that process takes about a minute, even, even less if you've done it a few times, so very fast. Uh, and then the last stage to, to set up is um, really setting your zero point. And we have a very fast way of doing that as well by selecting a natural feature point in your environment, um, clicking it, setting it, uh, and placing your zero point really in a matter of you know seconds. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the overview. And also, that was the question I did have about like how because I've seen the the, uh, the camera bar position on some cameras either like above the lens or some of it like below, like on the rails. Uh, and so I was kind of wondering because it seemed how how complex or how easy is it to uh, do the offset. And so that sounds yeah. Um, just to you know highlight that because our sensor tracks natural features, you may want to place it or orient it in a different position or area depending on what you want it to see. If you're shooting a green screen or an LED wall, you don't want it facing forward. So maybe you would point it up or down. If you're using a smaller camera with not a lot of real estate, you may want to place it off to the side or even on a tripod. Um, so as long as it's kind of on or near the camera, um, you know, you can really place a sensor wherever you want. It's omnidirectional. So you can, you know, it's got mounting points. You can put it on an arm or a, um, you know, any kind of accessory that kind of mounts on or near the camera. Do you have any uh, recent uh, recent stories or any kind of examples of like where uh, production wise that has like the flexibility of being able to have different uh, tracking abilities came into play? I could use a couple of like just anecdotal, you know, stories. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm most impressed when customers come to us, um, you know, and say how how surprised they were by what the system can track. Um, for example, I mean, we have, we've had customers shooting in the middle of a field, a grass, grassy field, uh, with, with no static points, you know, to look at other than, you know, the, the sky, the clouds, and the blades of grass. And, you know, our system, because it's so sensitive and in tune to the environment, it's constantly learning, you know, it's, it's, it's world, it's environment. Um, I mean, it can pick up, you know, blades of grass, contrast points between blades, um, and understand and remember points on a on a field. Um, you know, we have we have customers using this in in sports applications as well. Um, you know, picking up points on a on a football field, for example. Um, we've had stories of customers tracking in snow. So there's like you know mounds of snow and the shadows that the snow is creating is creating contrast points. One nice thing with our sensor is that it has um, a ver very close focus uh, of half a meter. So you can place the system in a car, for example, which is extremely unique. And, and you know one of the reasons why a lot of customers come to us for, for car plates or you know shooting uh, tracking within a, a very small space. Um, it can pick up points half a meter away. So maybe on your car's dashboard. Uh, or if you're again kind of outdoors in the middle of a field and you have a mountain, you know, half a mile, a mile away, with trees, you know, and rock kind of outcroppings, like the system can pick up those contrast points. It's very um, sensitive and attuned to its environment, and I'm always impressed when customers come to me with these stories of, you know, they they show up even to like a busy city with cars driving by, you know, and they orient the sensor up at, at a building with kind of a windows or, you know, facade, and they're able to track off of that, those details. Whereas other systems, you know, there's, there would be no way they would be able to track it in a particular environment. Ours performed, you know, extremely well. Shifting a little bit, um, but I, this sort of ties into tracking, but uh, other thing, new thing from Zeiss recently is the nano primes. Um, yeah. Can you kind of just uh, talk about the idea behind uh, creating this new specific uh, set of lenses and, we can dive into some more details from there. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously um, very excited 
to uh, to launch our new um, our new cinema lenses, our Nano Primes it is a six lens set E mount lenses. So they are kind of catered towards a specific market. A lot of customers were kind of waiting for a new set to come out. A lot of customers saw the CP3 brand and were hoping for kind of a CP4, that next line in the Zeiss ecosystem. And while it may kind of appear that way, if you look at the price point, the compact size and nature of the lens, I mean, these lenses are really built from the ground up. This is a lens technology that we've kind of designed really around our Supreme Primes. They're actually most comparable to our high-end Supreme Prime lenses, but in a much more compact form factor. And of course, the ability to be used with E-mount Sony cameras. But yeah, it's a, it's a six lens series. Uh, we're very excited to announce it at a very reasonable price point. Um, and um, you know, I think we're in a great position to, uh, to offer you know, these lenses to not just um, you know, high-end production, but also kind of um, middle-tier uh, emerging productions um, looking for a high quality look. What are some sort of either like common misconceptions or sort of details that you look for when picking a lens or that uh, like different aspects to look at when kind of choosing which lens to film a project at? Kind of what are some elements or some misconceptions that like different lenses have? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think customers have different motivations when choosing a lens. Basically, it could be creative motivation, it could be price motivation, it could be uh, ergonomics, you know, weight size. Um, so there's a lot of factors that play into choosing a lens. Certain DPs, you know, have a, you know, a, a specific brand or type of lens that they just know and love. And other DPs are more experimental and may use a lens for a given project to, of course, achieve a certain look that the director, you know, production is after. Other DPs, as you know, will go to Panavision or uh, specific lens houses and create their own look um, from scratch. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of motivations you know, coming coming into play. And, um, you know, I think for Zeiss, you know, we we take optics for us very seriously. We've been in this business for over 100 years, well over 100 years. And um, we you pride ourselves in building lenses that are, that are optically, um, that are engineered, uh, to be very optically accurate, um, that provide a very unique look thanks to our our coatings that we use, and we also offer consistency. When you when you use a Zeiss lens, you know, fifty is a fifty is a fifty. You know what you are getting with our lens. Now, with that, we we also of course listen to you know we have a good pulse on the industry. We have made a lot of you know, very close relationships over the years with. You know, major DPs, production houses, rental houses, to understand kind of what our customers are looking for. This is a very evolving industry. And we want to make sure that we are offering customers not just optically pure, consistent glass, but artistic choices. So I think you can see that in our radiance lenses. We have these amazing Supreme Prime lenses, and we've kind of redefined them with unique coatings to allow for more flare characteristics and kind of a unique look to our typical kind of glass. So our, our radiance lenses are a good kind of almost answer to customers saying, well, Zeiss only does, you know, the same thing. Um, you know, they have a very unique kind of clinical look. If you look at our radiance lenses, you can see that we do offer more of an artistic, flary product as well. We pride ourselves in, in high-end cinema glass. That being said, we also want to make sure, as you can see with our recent Nano release, that we aren't just offering the high end of the high end. You know, we're catering to kind of the middle markets as well to offer very high end quality optics for a much reasonable price. I think kind of in short, we, we take a lot of these factors, a lot of these motivations that I was describing into account um, and try to produce the best possible product for our customer. Last broad question, um, and this is totally not about Zeiss stuff, but AI, I'm going to ask this and you can answer, you can go whichever route you want. What's been on your radar with AI, but that could either be, you know, the generative stuff that we've been seeing popping up lately, like Sora and stuff, or this could yeah. be, I've been seeing more use cases of like actual kind of utility stuff, like using machine learning for like relighting scenes or kind of more practical, yeah. uh, yeah. maybe more immediate uses that we might be seeing with AI. So. Broad question to throw it out there, but like, what's been on your radar? What are you thinking about AI? Tanner, you want to start? As a broad tome. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, no, I, I could talk all day about it, so I'll let Tanner <laughs> go first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, Nick's a talker, as you can see. Nick likes to talk, but we, we, we balance each other. I think there's a balance with AI. I think there's a balance in which 
you know, technology is always emerging and it's always changing. And of course, you go too far down the rabbit hole and all of a sudden there's a lot of people concerned about jobs being sacrificed. But I think I was, I mean, it's definitely the hot topic that everybody's talking about. But I think there's a uh, talking actually about it with some of our other colleagues in a sense that, you know, there's chat GPT, you throw in some information and it's a one and done and text to video, it's done. But there's all these other categories in which you, it's not just that. There's going to be a point in time where everything's going to be so cookie cutter that you have to have something that's different. So then there's that variation of, okay, I'm using AI, but I have these blueprints in which I'm essentially adding my flair to AI. I'm using it as a tool. I can ask it. So it's just like the same thing. You have a Zeiss lens. I have a Zeiss lens. We're all not shooting the same thing. Sure, I can use AI, you can use AI, but we all have different ways in which we can use that technology to essentially empower our vision or what we're trying to achieve to adopt a lot of different things to where if we all just use the same word, sure, it's going to have somewhat of a cookie cutter, but it's not going to have so much variation. So I think there is a definitely a sense in which we still have our creative outlets to do it. I think there's some degree, of course, that sure, there's probably no way in which that it's not going to not have any impact on anybody. But I think that's always with, with the emerging technology period. You know, if you just take out AI out of the equation, you know, there's a lot of things that have been autonomized aside from out AI. So I think there's always mm -hmm. that case with technology and moving forward that there's always going to be some sacrifice now and that scale that kind of always is constantly balanced and trying to keep that mindset and how that how we look at it, I think, is what's the important part of, yes, sure, there's parts and jobs that are going to be sacrificed from this probably, but at the same time, there's a lot of different avenues in which you can make a new job outlet from using the AI and those controls. And I, we've seen that just from our standpoint, even from the technology and how that's used within virtual productions in terms of using video and then tracking um, and using the AI and how that is just a way more important now in terms of optical tracking to have that overlay in text to video and having all that information that you get instead of just having a video file and tracking it and knowing how that AI integrates with that video to give you a better understanding of your depth to your focus and how it gives it that more uh, real ability I would say is now even more critical in terms of having tracking because now we can have more of that information that's captured and give that actual information of like, oh, it, the lens was at f1.8 and it was focused at three meters away. You know, all that information that doesn't have to essentially be computized is now given accurately. Now, sure, it can maybe do a general idea and computize it and do an okay job, but if you can have that all the information, it speeds up the workflow, of course. So I think there's a lot of sense in I mean, I could probably keep talking about this all those things ago, but there really is a lot of avenues in which AI is definitely, uh, there's no going around. It's definitely here to stay from the way it's going. But I think there's definitely some cool aspects, and I always think there's always a give and take to it. But uh, I think it's just, you know, finding that balance and that perspective that you always have to kind of look into it a little bit more. But, yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to Nick. And he can. Yeah, no, thanks, Tanner. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a lot to unpack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the way I kind of look at it is this industry is all about content, creating content, delivering content. There's a few areas that AI has started to kind of become a hot topic within the industry and as it relates to content. So content creation, of course, creating video using AI from just inserting a prompt, creating scripts using AI. There's this kind of creative side to AI, which is kind of, you know, uh, strange, but it's obviously caused a lot of turmoil over the last nine months. As you can see, it was one of the main motivators for the strikes that we saw. And I'm happy that the industry, I guess it all kind of came to a heads, but like, I'm glad they kind of at least got out and talked it through and hopefully came up to a reasonable agreement as kind of how AI is managed within the content creation side of the business. I feel that the, the film industry specifically is, is um, it's all about human storytelling to create content. Um, and, and that should always, that should always be concrete. That, that should never change. Uh, I think using, this is all kind of personal views, but I, I think using AI to kind of help with content creation and almost like spur kind of artistic, 
uh, kind of the artistic flame, kind of spark the artistic flame is, is important, you know, and can be, can be helpful, maybe even therapeutic. If you kind of have writer's block to use AI to kind of mm -hmm. spark certain, um, creative ideas that you are coming up with. Uh, I, I, so I think there's, there's certain ways that AI can be used for, con for content creation, create kind of creative decision-making, but ultimately that should be up to kind of human human control, you know, let, let give that job, let, let, the, let the writers keep their jobs um, because they, they deserve it. Um, and, you know, there, there's other areas kind of within content creation, of course, that, that AI plays a factor, but I think that's kind of in my mind what, what I see. And then kind of the other area that I see AI really, I think, having a place is content management, analytics, mm -hmm. data, analy data analytics, you know, understanding kind of how best to, how to, to make content delivery more efficient, to make content delivery the highest possible quality for a given user, um, how to make the most out of, uh, out of, uh, out of um, distributing that content, um, how to store that content in an efficient way, uh, how to recall content using APIs and things to be able to, you know, pull data very quickly. Um, I think AI, is a tremendous help for post-production facilities and managing their content and deliverables um, for editors, you know, to be able to to store their content. Um, you know, I'm definitely not an expert in this field, but I'm, I'm even at HPA, which we were talking about earlier. You know, we're seeing a lot of companies really um, you know, embrace AI for for content management, and um, I think that's only going to make creatives. Um, more efficient with their workflows. It's, it's going to save productions money. It's going to allow for more um, higher quality content, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I think kind of AI in that sense will not so much take away jobs. I think it's only going to improve certain uh, areas of the industry, improve technologies, make things faster and easier for people, and of course, save people a lot, of, a lot more money, um, and really allow the creatives in this industry to do what they do best. So yeah, that's kind of my, uh, I, again, I could, I could talk a, li a lot about this, um, but I do feel like AI has a place in this industry. It's just more on the content management, the kind of the, the, the data side, the, 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 uh, the, the, the boring side of this industry that's very important. Um, but, you know, let the, let the, uh, let the humans uh, create the content. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the... Um... Uh, the utility aspect of it, of like, find me the footage where I, you know, I have a red car in this, or find me the footage where, uh, you know, someone says this line or spoken by this person of just like the foot, the, the logger jobs and the, uh, right. you know, rotoscoping is a common example too, of like, sure. no one likes rotoscoping. The AI can replace that. Um, very, yet very fair point. The entry yeah, exactly. level stuff that might get replaced. Yeah. The, the, so the can... time consuming kind of Draw where you're sitting in a dark room, you know, analyzing data yes. or, or pulling, typing, you know, typing file, out the file types. Of, yeah, it's transcripts, yeah. you know, a lot yeah. of that kind of dull work we can give the robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no problem there. Um, well, cool. Well, I appreciate the time, Nick and uh, Tanner. Thanks, uh, thanks yeah. a lot for sharing thanks everything for about me. everything that's working on with Zeiss. Anytime. And uh, yeah, uh, best spot people to learn more about uh, some crafts and everything that's going on. Uh, yeah, so um, Tanner and I are based in LA. We work out of the Zeiss Sherman Oaks showroom. I encourage anybody and everybody to stop by. It's a really cool space. It's a bit of a museum here. We'd love to have anyone come by anytime. We can share our, our contact information, you know, in somewhere in the uh, in the podcast kind of header details. Um, but yeah, you can reach out to us anytime for, for a, a meeting here at our showroom in Sherman Oaks. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, if uh, you'd like to learn more about SynCraft Scenario, our, our nano prime lenses, or anything that, that Zeiss may be doing, um, I encourage you to visit um, Zeiss.com. You can also check out our YouTube channel, uh, which you mentioned a second ago. Uh, Joey, thanks for that, the call out. We do have a, a full playlist of uh, tutorials uh, available for our customers. I think uh, kind of next up for us um, would be NAB. So for all of those listening, uh, please stop by our booth uh, at NAB. We'd love to see you there. Nice. Yeah, and we will be there too. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you there. Good. Oh, cool. All right. Nice. And that is it for this episode of VP Land. Many thanks to Nick and Tanner for coming on and chatting about all things virtual production. Links for everything we talked about are in the show notes, either in YouTube or over at the website at vp-land.com. And again, for the latest news and info on virtual production, AI and filmmaking, all the latest tech that is changing the way we're making movies, 
be sure to subscribe to the VP Land newsletter, vp-land.com. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.